So those that were married and stayed true to their spouses breathed a little bit of a sigh of relief. And then they told us that AIDS could be spread through blood transfusions. If someone had that virus and they had donated blood and you needed blood for some reason, you could get the AIDS virus through that transfusion. So we were all afraid again. Then when someone got cut in a basketball game, any sport, anyone that treated them had gloves on up to their elbows and masks and all kinds of things to make sure that they didn't touch that blood in any way, shape, or form in fear of getting infected by that blood. It was scary. They come up with some drugs that curb it. They haven't healed it. But the fear level has increased significantly. When the AIDS virus infects somebody, it attacks the immune system. The immune system becomes so weakened that the lightest, the smallest little infection could be life-threatening because their immune system just simply could not battle against it. The United States, the world, has become infected in such a way. It has become infected by sin, by immorality, and the immune system has been weakened so that it cannot effectively help. The church is that immune system. We have been weakened to a point, and it has happened so fast, that we're not helping the problem. We are even a part of the problem at some times. Now we tend to blame groups, others, anyone else, the politicians. <coughs> One party will blame the other. The Democrats, it's their fault. The Democrats say, no, it's the Republicans' fault. We may blame it on the racists. We may blame it on society itself. We can blame Hollywood. We can blame anyone, it seems, but ourselves. We fail to look inward. You know, much of society already looks at the church as an enemy. They look at us, much like Jesus looked at the Pharisees, self-righteous, finger-pointing hypocrites. In some cases, they're right. In other cases, People are simply joining in in that sin and morality, not recognizing it as sin or as immorality. They have been so inundated with it, it's the norm. It's what we expect. We need to realize that the problem isn't necessarily sinners sinning because sinners have always sinned. We all sin. Sin has been with us for a long, long time. Matter of fact, the Bible even tells us that we're kind of expected to sin. Well, Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. And you he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. We were born into sin. Sin has been around since Eve picked that forbidden fruit and took that first bite. It began to spread as Adam joined in. And it has been spreading steadily ever since. But God is a loving God. He had a plan for us. A plan to deliver us from our sins. A plan to help us to become righteousness. To become righteous. As we read in Ephesians 2, 4, and 5. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, 
even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. When we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we are forgiven. We are forgiven not just for the sins that we had before and up to the point that we asked Jesus into our lives. We are forgiven for the sins before, at that time, and in the future. But make no mistake, just because we're already forgiven for those sins in the future doesn't give us license to commit more sins. Peter tells us so as much in 1 Peter 1, 13 and 16. Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, rest your hope for fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lust as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. We are to emulate Jesus Christ. We are to try and do as he did, walk as he walked, be sin-free as he did. We know it's not possible to be completely sin-free, but it is up to us to try and be as close to sin-free as we humanly can. Strive for it. Walk towards it. Try to be Christ-like. I believe that we need to work on the immune system of this country and this world, the church. What can we do to help to strengthen that immune system? I believe that we need to begin with prayer. And I've said it before, and I'll say it again right now. If we're going to get involved for God, we need to have God involved with us. Go to God, pray to him, talk to him, ask for him to be involved. Get him in the middle of the situation. Now I want to focus on the type of prayer. Last week we talked about prayer needs going to God, asking for help in our personal lives, how to do that, the types of things to ask for. Today, I want to look at intercessory prayer a little bit. Now, normally when we think of intercessory prayer, we're praying for the needs of someone, a friend or a family relative that is sick or needs some kind of spiritual guidance. I want us to be looking at praying for the church, interceding for the church and the church body all over the world. You know, sometimes it's hard to admit that we need prayer for ourselves, for the church. In 1996, there was a pastor by the name of Joe Wright. He was the pastor, the guest chaplain at the House of Kim, the Kansas House of representatives and delivered their opening prayer. This prayer was actually a prayer written by another pastor, a pastor by the name of Bob Russell. Bob Russell at the time was the pastor at East Side Christian Church or Southeast Side Christian Church in Louisville, Kentucky, one of the largest Christian churches in the country. This prayer stirred up a lot of controversy. Enough so that one of the members of the house actually walked out during the prayer because he objected to what he was praying for. This same prayer, a copy of it, reached Paul Harvey. Paul Harvey had a very popular radio show. When he read this prayer on the air live, it had such a response that it had a larger response than any other radio show he had ever done. I'd like to read that prayer for you right now. Oh God, we know that the word says, woe to those who call evil good, but that's exactly what we have done. We have lost our spiritual equilibrium and inverted our values. We confess that we have ridiculed the absolute truth of your word and called it moral pluralism. 
We have worshipped other gods and called it multiculturalism and new age spirituality. <coughs> we have committed adultery and called it an affair. We have endorsed perversion and called it an alternative lifestyle. We have exploited the poor and called it the lottery. We have neglected the needy and called it frugality. We have rewarded laziness and called it welfare. We have killed our unborn children and called it choice. We have shot abortions and called it justifiable. We have neglected to discipline our children and called it building self-esteem. We have failed to execute justice speedily as your word commands and called it due process. We have failed to love our neighbor who has a different color of skin and called it maintaining racial purity. We have abused power and called it political savvy. We have coveted our neighbor's possessions and called it ambition. We have polluted the air with profanity and pornography and called it freedom of expression. We have made the Lord's Day the biggest shopping and entertainment day of the week and called it free enterprise. We have ridiculed the time-honored values of our parents and called it enlightenment. Search us, O God. Know our hearts today. Try us and see if there be some wicked way in us. Cleanse us of every sin and set us free. Though our sins be as scarlet, may they become white as snow. Though they be as crimson, may they be as wool. Now, as I read that prayer, <coughs> did it offend you? Was there anything in there that you particularly disagreed with? We as a church living in today's society have become numb to some of these and other things that are openly accepted today as the norm. Because we've become numb to them, we need to pray for several things. First among them, we need to pray for awareness. We have become so inundated with the sin that has become acceptable in today's society that we don't recognize much of it as sin. Premarital sex. Do we simply accept that as the norm? If we do, the church has failed. Profanity. When we hear it, even when we hear someone laying God's name in vain, do we simply say, well, that's just the way people talk today? Do we simply accept, turn our heads, and walk away when sin is right in front of us? Because that's the way it is today. If so, the church is failing. We need to pray that we are aware, that we can recognize, and that we avoid those sins, those immoralities. We need to be examples examples by what we say and what we do. <clears throat> we need to not point fingers at those that are committing those sins and instead do like the Bible tells us, take them aside and lovingly point it out to them. Matthew 18, 15 through 16. Now this is directed to brothers and sisters in Christ, but it applies just as well in the world. It says, moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. But if he will not hear, take with you one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. People don't like to be called sinners. I know that may be a surprise. But they especially don't like to be called sinners in front of someone else. Take them aside. Point it out in love. Don't be accusatory. Don't say you're going to hell. You say, look, are you aware? Let me help you through this. God loves you. And he loves you enough to forgive you. Pray for awareness of yourself and awareness in the church. Second, we need to pray for God's presence. 
How many times did the Israelites turn their back on God in the Old Testament? There was a cycle. The, cycle, the Israelites would sin, turn their back on God, they'd be punished, they'd ask for forgiveness, and then it wasn't long before they did it again. Time after time, they turned their back on God, denied God. Yet he forgave when they asked, when they repented. We, they, rather, wanted a God of convenience, a God that they could manipulate, a God that did just what they wanted to. When you have a God that is a God of convenience, that does exactly what we want them to, we have become our God. We are not God. We have to accept God as God is. God is all knowing, all powerful, all seeing. We need to let God be in control, not control him. Lean on him, depend on him. Expect him to be in control. When we do, we will be blessed. When the Israelites did, they suffered. Here's what the Bible tells us will happen if we do. Psalm 33, 12. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people whom he has chosen for his own inheritance. Pray that God will be involved in our every action, our every word, our every thought of every day. Pray that it is his will that be done, not ours. Third, we need to pray for protection. Now, when I say pray for protection, I'm not talking about praying for protection from persecution. There's nothing wrong with praying for protection from persecution. <coughs> but persecution has been around for, since the first day of the church. It's going to be around until Jesus returns again. What I'm looking at is persecution, not persecution, but protection from the evil one. From Satan himself. Satan is out there and he is at war with us. We need protection from him. Ephesians 6, 10 and 11 says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Satan himself. Make no mistake about it, the devil is in our midst. He is at War. He is at battle in this very moment. He's very smart. We talked a couple weeks ago about some of the great generals that we've had on the earth, Napoleon Bonaparte, Robert E. Lee, generals like that. Generals like that are like children as far as strategy when they stand next to Satan. He is a master. He is so smart in some of his strategies that we don't even know that he's attacking. He has hit us so hard and so subtly that we're not aware of it. We need the armor of God. We need God's protection. We need to pray that we can recognize the truth of Jesus Christ, the protection of his righteousness, the preparedness of his gospel, the faith in his sacrifice for us, and we need to go back again and again and again to God's Word. God's Word shows us that He is with us. It reminds us that He is Lord. And He tells us how to be His. How to follow Him. If we do, and we have his protection. We know that Revelation 17, 14 is going to come to pass. It says, these will make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those who are with him are called chosen and faithful. We will win Amen. if we are faithful. If we live by God's will 
rather than ours or society's will. So pray for God and his protection. We also need to pray for revival. This land needs revival. But before this land can experience revival, we need revival right here in the church. This church, the church down the block, the church in China, the churches all around the world need a revival. They need to be lit on fire. They need to be getting excited about God, excited about Jesus, and excited about the Holy Spirit. They need to become salt once again. Jesus said, we are the salt of the earth. He didn't say we're the salt sitting in a salt shaker. You don't go to the store and buy salt, pour it in a shaker, and set it on a shelf and just let it be. That salt does no good if you don't take it out of that shaker and pour it on your food. Let it penetrate that food. We need to go out, be poured out upon the land, and penetrate the land for Jesus Christ. Get God back in America all over America. Then we need to pray for God's intervention as we go into the world. Show us the people to go to. Open their ears, open their minds to what we have to say to them. Then Holy Spirit has been promised that he will give us the words to say. <coughs> pray that we can go and do so that they can hear the good news and they know that they need to repent and how to do it. Second Chronicles 7.14 tells us that my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. It is time for us, America, to call on his name. It is time for us to repent. It is time to trust in him. The Bible warns us that we would come to this point where we are right now. See if you don't agree that we are here where we are told we would be in 2 Timothy 4, 3 and 4. For the time will come when people will put up with sound, will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. The world is living those myths. They have turned away from sound doctrine and are listening to and following exactly what they wanted. It's time for the church to show the world what the truth is. We need to show them through our actions and our words. We need to pray above all else that we are doing God's will, not ours, and not society. As we come to our time of invitation today, maybe you haven't already accepted Jesus as your personal Savior. Maybe you don't know the truth. Maybe you're not familiar with the whole truth. You can learn that today. You can come to Jesus, accept him as your personal Savior, and learn, live the truth. If you've already been baptized, Jesus is already your Savior, and you're looking for a church home. We'd love to have you. You can join today. And third, if you have a prayer need, I know it's been a tough week for several people. If you have a prayer need you'd like for the church to pray for you with, if you'd like me to pray with you, you can sit down here on the front pew and we can pray. Or if you prefer, we've got an elder in the back and Eddie right here in the middle. You can go to any one of us, and we'll be happy to pray with you. If any of these three things meet your needs today, I invite you to come forward as we all stand and sing our hymn of invitation.
somewhere along, but it's always been a huge thing, and it was a huge thing last month, and it was a huge thing in a lot of other things, but, you know, there's lots of parades, there's lots of things going on, but there was very little about education that was founded on. This nation seems to forget sometimes part of the Pledge of Allegiance has God in it. The songs we sang have God in it. Declaration of Independence even mentions God and separation of church and state, I know. But God is in this country and we tend to forget him. We've got to remember. Let's pray. Father God, we cannot possibly ever forget you. We cannot turn our backs on you. We have to keep you in our lives. We need to let you be in control of our lives. We have to trust you. We have to lean on you. Lord, you are our everything. Thank you for the sacrifice of your son, allowing us to come into your presence to be forgiven sin. Thank you for letting us love you. All these things we pray in Jesus' name. 